Good morning, happy Sabbath, everyone, from uh, transmitting live here for the Scottsdale Thunderbird Church. Uh, I know uh, you guys are uh, wanting to get back here. We heard from several of you um, that are wondering when are we opening. Well, we met with the board, and the plan is for June 13. That's when we're going to be able to gather here. Uh, the deacons are making uh, plans and preparations so that we can have safety as we start to gather. Uh, physically together, but we'll try to remain together uh, emotionally, socially, and most important, spiritually. So we want to welcome everybody that's joining. If you want to share this feed uh, with your family, your friends, or uh, leave us a comment. If you want prayers as well, uh, leave those in the comment section. Or if you're watching it at a different time, we thank you for uh, also uh, joining this feed and uh, watching our service from Scottsdale Thunderbird. Today we're going to have uh, Daniel preach, and we're also going to have uh, special music. But before we go into that, please bow your heads for a word of prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for this day. Thank you that you um, are giving us the opportunity to come into all of our wonderful friends and families' homes through the technology. Um, thank you that you've been able to provide the means for us to keep uh, preaching about your love and about uh, the promises that you have for us. Uh, we thank you for all the blessings that you've given us, and we also want to pray for the Holy Spirit to be with those who may have lost their job, may have lost their health, and or are struggling financially. Uh, we ask that the Holy Spirit gives them comfort, and that you also uh, uh, provide an outlet, uh, of course, for, for their difficulties. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. morning church is so happy to be here although it's an empty church I know back at home you are doing well and you are with your loved ones and the song I'm going to share today with you um, talks about the faithfulness of God and I impersonally I have experienced his faithfulness many many times in my life and something I'm learning to do is to focus on that not to focus on my circumstances, especially now that we are going through this really, really rough time um, together as, an, as a, not as a nation, as a world, uh, and we're social distance and whatnot, but even personally, if you are going through a hard time, whatever it might be, focus on God's faithfulness, because he says, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. He wants to bless us. So let's focus on that instead of our circumstances.
thank Eva for that special uh, music. Uh, it's such great to hear uh, that wonderful music, that wonderful lyric. There's something um, about having that connection to the music and to the lyrics. Um, but I can't wait to, uh, for somebody who can't sing like you, eventually get to heaven and be able to participate with everybody out there uh, singing praises to our Lord Jesus. So, I want you to uh, look there in your Bibles. We're going to be doing our scripture reading today from John, John uh, verse uh, chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. And it says, Then the Lord said, You feel sorry about the tent, but you did nothing to put it there. It came out quickly and died quickly. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual death, not to mention all the others. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a thing? Good morning. Oh, it's a little different with the empty church and, uh, just can't wait to get back and worship with everybody. Uh, did notice uh, a little changes. Uh, apparently, if you don't put a suit on for a few while, a little while and you leave it hanging in the closet, it shrinks. Um, it's, I've missed everybody. This is an interesting weekend. This is a special weekend. This is Memorial Day weekend. And uh, Memorial Day weekend is a time that we stop and we remember the people who have sacrificed so that we can have the freedom that we do, the freedom to worship in peace, the freedom to, I'm sorry. Oh, I can hardly hear. Uh, the freedom to worship in peace, and I think about the people in my family that have sacrificed their life to where we can have the freedom. Um, friends that I've had, a friend that uh, died of Agent Orange long after the Vietnam War ended, um, uncle that I've never met. All the sacrifices that were put in to make in, in, in this country free and to keep this country free. And I think about Jesus who sacrificed everything he had so that we could have the ultimate freedom. And we're looking at Jonah today, and before we start, uh, let's bow our heads for prayer. Good morning, Father. Thank you so much for your son. Thanks for the freedom that we have to worship you. The freedom to call you our God and our Father, and the promise that we will be with you soon. Please, I don't want it to be my words, but your words. Please lead in, in this message, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll be honest with you, this is a little bit strange for me, is normally there's a lot of people or, you know, quite a few people, and I, I like to engage with people. So uh, it's a little bit different, but what's important is the Word of God and understanding His message. So we're talking about Jonah. We're talking about Nineveh. Does anybody uh, know where we find, first find the story or mention of Nineveh? We go back to Genesis chapter 10. You're learning about the story of Noah. It's one of the most boring chapters in the Bible where it talks about so-and-so begat so-and-so, so-and-so begat so-and-so. But you get through it, and, and uh, you come down to, it gets interesting around verse 8. It says, Now Cush became the father of Nimrod. He became a mighty man on the earth, and he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it was, like, it was said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. In verse 10, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Eric, and Achad, and another one, in the land of Shinar. From that land, he went forth into Assyria and built Nineveh. But what happened over there at Babel in the land of Shinar? 
If you skip over to the next chapter, it kind of gives a story of what happened there. And Babel was a place where everybody came together and apparently Nimrod made a kingdom. And they said, well, let's make a tower up to heaven and let's make a name for ourselves, our own kingdom. And he started to conquer, it sounds like, nations around him. And God says, well, this isn't good. So he confused the languages in chapter 11, and we see back in chapter 10 that Nimrod left that area and went and built Nineveh. So Nineveh is an extension of Babel, which became Babylon, which means confusion. And here we see two, 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 two types of kingdoms. The first type is what the devil pick, uh, sets up. The kingdom that the devil has is, I am king, worship me, and the people are there to support the kingdom. The kingdom that God set up, you can see an example of it in freeing the slaves from Egypt, and then God came down and lived with the people. They didn't have a king. They had a God that would serve their needs, a God that loved them and took care of everything that they needed from day to day, their food, their water, their clothes, nothing wore out. Nimrod, the king of Nineveh, started this process in Nineveh, and it grew and grew, and this city became very wicked. If we skip over to Jonah, chapter 1, Jonah chapter 1, we see that Jonah is called to go and preach to Nineveh. It says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, this is chapter 1, verse 2, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. So everything would go great if Jonah had said, Okay, I'll, I'll do what you want. Let me go and, and talk to him and let me tell him who you are and let me say what you have to say to him about what's going on in their city. But verse 3, But Jonah rose up and fled to Tarshish, from the presence of the Lord. Now, why would he do that? In order to understand this, it helps if you know a little bit of the history of who Nineveh was, as far as in relation to Israel. So Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. Assyria was the kingdom that eventually wiped out and destroyed Israel and took everybody that lived in Israel away, who they didn't kill, and then brought other people in and repopulated the area with their own people, which became the Samaritans in Jesus' time. This is a nation that has been harassing Israel for a long time. So it makes sense that Jonah really doesn't want to help these people out. More than that, he says, let me, I, I don't want this mission at all. I am going to run. I'm going to go do my own thing. It says, verse 3, but Jonah rose up and fled to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. And he paid the fare and went down to go with them. And there's a couple more downs that are mentioned later. See, every time I found in my life every time that I run from God, every time that I decide to do my own thing, the only direction that I go is down. The interesting thing about this first chapter is, as he goes down to the ship, we all know the story. He goes down to the ship, the ship goes out and it gets tossed around with this big uh, storm. And it's important to note that it says that God sent a storm. Now, a lot of times, natural disasters happen. COVID, we, we weren't expecting this. A lot of bad things happen, and we start to say, well, what's going on here? And a lot of people blame God. Most of the time, it's not God that does bad things. It's not God that creates storms. It's not God that, that creates bad events that, that happen to us. We live in a world of sin, and everything that is bad that happens is a result of that sin. But it says that God caused this storm. 
See, sometimes God has to wake us up. Sometimes God has to say, you're going in the wrong direction. If I don't do something drastic to stop you, you're going to have disastrous results. So he gets in the ship, and there's this huge storm, and they find Jonah sleeping, and the guy, the, the uh, captain says, hey, wake up, call on your God. He find out that he's a Hebrew. In verse 10, then the men became extremely frightened, and they said to him, how could you do this? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord. So they said to him, verse 11, what should we do that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was becoming increasingly stormy. He said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea, then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that that is the count of me that this great storm has come upon you. So the question is, who said that what they should do was to pick him up and throw him into the water? Was it God's message to say, throw Jonah into the water? Jonah's the one that said, if you toss me in, it'll be fine for you. The idea is that Jonah had decided that he would rather die than go preach to Nineveh. If he would have said, look, guys, this is my fault. Let me pray to God right now. Let me get my heart right with God. Let me go do what he wants me to do. Jonah would not have had to go through that fish experience. But he decided to do things his own way. And he would rather die than to go preach to Nineveh. So they picked up, I, I love this part. In verse 13, however the men rode desperately to return to the land, they could not, for the sea became even stormier against them. See, the people, we would expect the heathens to be like, okay, you said if we throw you in, everything will be good for you. You're gone. Let's go. But the people that we would expect in the story to be the most ruthless people, the people that were not the Israelites, the people that were not following God, they were the ones that said, hey, wait a minute, your life is precious to us. We want to do everything we can in our power to make sure that you can be saved. And finally, they realized that they couldn't overcome the storm, so they picked Jonah up and threw him into the sea. It says, verse 15, the, the sea stopped raging. Then the men feared the Lord greatly, and they offered sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Those people in the boat were converted from that experience. How about Jonah? In verse 17, then the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. And let's skip to chapter 2, verse 1. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the stomach of the fish. I remember there was no chapters and verses for centuries after this was written. So in the original text, this just flows. So the way the story goes is, Jonah is thrown into the water, God created a big fish to, to swallow him up. And he's in that fish for three days. Then he prays. I heard someone say it, it, there, was a, there was a conversation where there was a person wor working on a telephone line. And uh, he was overhearing a conversation between two pastors about which was the best way to pray. And one says, well, you should bow your head and close your eyes and, you know, be extremely reverent. And the other guy said, no, you should raise your hands and, and look to heaven and praise God for who he is. And the repairman couldn't hold it in any longer. He says, you know, when I do my best praying, it's when I'm hanging upside down from a telephone pole. The idea is when we are in the greatest danger of our lives, we cry out to God. Now, Jonah has been in a storm, which seemed very deadly to everybody around him. He's been thrown into the 
water, which if nobody is around, no boaters around, stormy sea, he would probably drown. He's been swallowed by a fish, and it takes him three days in the stomach of a fish before he prays. Now, some people look at this and say, well, this is an allegory, obviously, because uh, first of all, a whale can't swallow a man. And second of all, I, I saw where a snake swallowed an alligator, and it took three days to dissolve that alligator and the snake. The, the alligator was bigger than the snake's stomach, so it would dissolve some, and then it would move it in and dissolve more. But still, there was nothing left that that alligator could survive after part of the first day from being absorbed in that stomach. So how can a man be in a belly of a fish for three days and still be alive? And the key to that is that the text says that God prepared this fish. It doesn't say it was a whale. It says it was a fish. Looking at my time here. So he prays and he, he gets vomited out. And he decides, okay, I'm going to go to Nineveh. In chapter 3, verse 3, it says, So Jonah rose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' walk. Then Jonah began to go from the city one day's walk, and he cried and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh will be destroyed. And what does this mean, three days' walk? Now, Nineveh has been excavated, and it was about 2.9 square miles. The circumference of the wall was about seven and a half miles. And even Nassim, um, working on his crutch, probably wouldn't take him three days to walk seven and a half miles. I'm, I'm guessing. Jonah, who was probably a very healthy man at this time. It shouldn't take him three days to walk around Nineveh. So what's going on? Well, Nineveh is a city, but it's also a province. So it's possible that it was the province, and it took him three days. It's also possible that where he was thrown up, it took him three days to walk to the city. Um, what's important, I think, is the three days versus one day. Apparently, it was a three days walk, three days journey, but he waited until the first end of the first day before he started preaching. You could take that to say that he was so anxious to preach, he was preaching long before he got to the city. I don't think that's the case. I think he was waiting a full day before he got up the nerve to start preaching. He really did not want to preach to these people. We know the story is... Nineveh, they hear the message, hey, let's, let's make sure that we repent. Let's get back on God's side. Let's pray. The Ninevites, they decided to humble their hearts. And God looked at them and said, I, I can't destroy those guys. So Jonah sits up on a hill and he waits for the city to be destroyed. And when it doesn't, he gets mad. It says, chapter 4, verse 1, But it greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry. And this is the heart of why he ran. He said, he prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was this not what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall, uh, forestall this, I fled to Tarshish. For I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. Jonah says the reason he fled was because he knew if he preached to Nineveh, they might actually repent and decide to do what God wants, 
decide to have a relationship with God, decide to humble themselves before God, and if they did that, God might not destroy them. In other words, he hated the people in Nineveh so much that he was willing to give his own life if only they could be killed. So God brings up this parable of a, of a fruit, of a vine. He's sitting up on this hill. He's, he's getting tortured with the heat, and God brings up a vine to shade him. So now he's all happy. He can sit there and relax, waiting for the destruction of his enemies. And then God sends a worm, and the vine withers, and now he's got to face the heat again. And he gets mad at the vine that has died. In verse 10, chapter 4, in verse 9, Then God said to Jonah, Do you have a good reason to be angry about the plant? And he said, I have good reason to be angry, even to death. Then the Lord said, verse 10, If you had compassion, he said, You had compassion on the plant for which you didn't work, which you didn't cause to grow, which, you came, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right and their left. Every single person is a person that God has created. Every single person is a person that God loves. And every single person is a person that God wants in his kingdom. What's the point? The point is if we are more concerned about where a person stands politically, morally, or nationally, than we are with their life, with their relationship with God, with God's desire to see them in his kingdom, then we don't have the heart of Christ. We have the danger of sitting with Jonah up on the hill waiting for our enemies to be destroyed. If you're a Democrat and God says, I need you to go speak to Trump because I want him in my kingdom, and if you don't want to do it because Trump is your enemy, that's a heart issue. If you're a Republican and God says, I want you to go speak with Nancy Pelosi because I want her in my kingdom. And you say, I don't want to do that because I just don't want her there. That's a heart issue. If God says, I need you to go to Beijing or to Moscow, and you say, I'm an American, I would rather not. The priorities are an issue. This is a week that we sit and we think about all the sacrifice that's given to make and keep this nation free. More than that, we should think about Jesus, who died to make us all free, who died so that we could all be in his kingdom. And if we don't want every single person in that kingdom, we have to be careful that we will not be there ourselves. Jesus gave Jonah as an example of himself. He said, as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Starting Thursday night, his sweat, as he uh, had uh, drops of blood sweating through his forward, uh, forehead, he was in the heart of the earth, suffering for our sins. I've forgotten that sometimes. If somebody cuts me off in traffic, I can get angry and say, oh, I'm going to get you. 
I need a broken heart. I need a heart like Jesus. I need a heart that says, that is somebody that God created. Somebody that God loves. God wants them in his kingdom. Thank you, Dan, for such a, an important message and an important reminder that everybody, every single person, maybe, maybe it doesn't have to be somebody so far in China or Russia. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's that neighbor. Maybe it's that friend. They're also creatures of God. We're all created in his image. And we need to pray for them and we need to witness if we are called. Maybe reluctantly like Jonah, but still it's up to us to witness about that love that Jesus Christ has for all. So we are going to be closing in prayer. Um, I know George also mentioned in the comments that he wants us to be praying for uh, our pastoral search. We do have an interview this week. Um, we're putting this in, in God's hands. And if you have other prayer requests you can let us know we're trying to keep that unity when the church through prayer through these meetings through Bible study as well so we're trying to utilize as many channels uh, and venues as possible to re remain connected and hopefully as we grow stronger as a church we can also start inviting those others uh, around us family members people in the community but uh, bow your head down wherever you are as we're going to finish with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for this message. Thank you for your love for us and, and how you are so patient. And even when we, we don't want to listen, we go the other way and we might be stubborn. I, I can certainly identify with stubbornness and, and help me recognize that and, and allow your love work in my heart so that we can uh, really listen to where you want us to lead us because you have such tremendous love that we need to continue sharing this message of love salvation and redemption through your son jesus christ amen thank you everybody